said, if, if the distortion of God's way of sexuality becomes mainstream or accepted in America, he said, not only that be the demise of our culture, but it will go, it will take it will take the percentage of those who practice that lifestyle from about 2 to 3% up to 20 to 25%. And it's happening now. Way ahead of his time. But he's still standing. Still standing. Specifically, what I'd done in the message six years ago was to take the book of Revelation with its 27 references to Christ as the Lamb and suggest it's the only way Christ treats sin. In other words, Jesus is only a touchy-feely lamb, if you leave it right in that category. <clears throat> Pastor, it's true, he is the lamb. It says it 27 times in the book of Revelation. It's true, we overcome by the blood of the lamb. It's true, Revelation 22.1, we are told that the river of life proceeds out of the throne of God and the Lamb. However, Jesus Christ is much more than the Lamb. He's the Lion. He's the Lion of Judah. One little text I've discovered can clarify... And that one text can put in perspective the other 27 references of Jesus as the Lamb. Go to Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> Sometimes I wish I could be like, what was it, the town of Joshua when the sun stood still? <coughs> Revelation chapter 5. This is the Lamb takes the scroll. It was mentioned in Sabbath school, I believe, to open the seals. Did you mention that, Ricky? Yes, sir. But I'm going to keep your finger there. Just turn the page if you're like me. Then go to 6 1. Now I saw that when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice come, with a voice like thunder, come and see. So the Lamb is opening the scrolls. But guess what? Jesus has two names. Actually, he's got many names. Yes. Go back to 5-5. Five, five. All right. Verse 4. 5-4. Five, four. So I wept much because no one, John's writing, was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Now we just read it in 6.1 that who did it? The Lamb did. But look at verse 5. <clears throat> but one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, behold the what? Lion. It didn't say lamb, it says lion. That confused me. John's not trying to confuse us. He's getting to think outside of our little narrow boxes. Because he's both. He's both. The lamb and the lion are the same person. Let's not split God into gods of our own making. I'm convinced that when Dale Martin does that, I, it's not God that I'm worshiping, but a God that I prefer. Mm -hmm. Rather than the full orbed God of Scripture. What does the first commandment say? Thou shalt what? Have no other gods before me. It's true, He is the only God who is love. And love has infinite characteristics. When it says God is omniscient, that's under his love. Same with omnipotent, omnipresent. Truth, holiness, graciousness, goodness, sovereignty, mercy. The list is as infinite as he is. 
There's one huge attribute that's under attack these days that I did not mention. Did anybody listen for it? Let me read that little list again. Omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, truth, holiness, graciousness, goodness, sovereignty, mercy. What's glaringly missing from that list? Of course, it's, I said it's an infinite list. I just gave you some highlights. What's under attack in America right now? Justice. Justice. We have now a two-tiered justice system. Laws for me, but not for thee. That's not the kind of God I worship. Justice. That's the one that's under fire. And that comes under the Lion of Judah. I'll show them just because I try to figure out what to bind this off and say a couple of things about Revelation 17. Because I'm actually talking about the sixth head right now that's going to eventually merge into the image to the beast, the seventh head, and who will give its power back to the rejuvenating powers. That's it in a nutshell. The one that's under fire, even in our society, is God's justice. Yes. Justice has become a human construct. The opposite of justice is anarchy, isn't it? Yeah. And when you've got a major politician celebrating it or not speaking out against it, that's serious stuff. It's become a human construct in our tear America down culture. Unless someone can show me other... America's not perfect. I, George, God set up her principles. And I'm going to defend those principles as long as I can have a voice. Amen. Unless someone can show me otherwise, anytime you place an adjective in front of justice, I'm going to give you two exceptions to that. But generally, this is, I believe this is true. And I had a long discussion with this with my judge, Dr. Am I thinking about Brooklyn? She, she's a great correct. Isn't it, isn't it cool to get having kids straighten you out sometimes? <laughs> if you're not, if you don't allow your kids to straighten you out sometimes, then you're not a very good parent. What kind of judge is she? She's a general sessions court judge. So when they get arraigned, they appear for her. Plus a juvenile, and she does some civil law too. She, she just had a fascinating case with juvenile law this week, but that's the Justice is justice. It's not social justice. It's not gender justice. It's not racial justice. That's a distortion of the term. Does that make sense? Justice is justice. Because you remember back in the text that B read? What were the priests doing? They were interpreting the law partially. It's good for you. It ain't good for you. That's what happens when you put an adjective in front of justice. Yes, I know there's a Supreme Court justice. That's a proper noun. I know there's a, you can study in, in uh, college or high school, criminal justice, but that kind of adjective is somewhat redundant. It's not separate like social or gender or racial. Does that make any sense? So, back to our text. The Lion of Judah and the Lamb are the same person. What does this mean, Dale? Very simply, to the wicked, our God is the Lion, and He will destroy. But that same Lion will protect the righteous. Amen. Amen. That's why there's no casualties on the righteous side. And there's no survivors on the wicked. To the wicked, the lamb is salvation rejected. To the righteous, the lamb is salvation received and obeyed. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can bind this up. No. Re Revelation 17. Go there with me. Oh, I love this Oh, I love that book, Debbie. I'm glad you've read it. Oh, let's see. Let 
Mary, Mary Jane is ready. You have it. You have it. You haven't had it. It's on the it's on the PDF though. Yes, it is on the PDF. Stacy and I are planning to get it published hopefully by Christmas. After I move. I'll re reprint it. Buffy's working on a, a new cover. It's great. Why are you saying all this, Dale? This sounds so is your Bible open to Revelation 17? I'm going to introduce it. I'm going to introduce this with a quote from a, a Russian Orthodox thinker. His name is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. How many of you know who he is? Alexander Solzhenitsyn. <clears throat> you know, you hear about Reagan, Ronald Reagan, and Margaret Thatcher. Pope John Paul II is being primary players in taking down the Iron Curtain in 1989. That's not exactly accurate. This is the dude that did it. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. This is the guy that did it. He spent 11 and a half years in the Russian prison system. And he came out. He was expelled from Russia in 1974. Why they didn't kill him is by the grace of God. He came out and he was expelled in 1974, comes to America in 1975, delivers three speeches, goes to Britain, or BBC, yeah, to Britain, and delivers two more. And then in 1978, three years later, he delivers the commencement address at Harvard. He has been vilified by the left ever since. You know what? Because he was warning us that we're on the same track of Marxism. And now we've got it running for president. Solzhenitsyn wrote this in 1975. Actually, this is part of his speech. Do we really, do we really have to wait for the moment when the knife is at our throat? Couldn't it be possible ahead of time? This is what Ellen White was writing in volume 8, page 307. You need to know what's going on. Couldn't it be possible ahead of time to assess soberly the worldwide menace that threatens to swallow the whole world? I was swallowed myself. I have been in the dragon's belly in its red hot innards. It was unable to digest me and it threw me up. I have come here to be, to you, to, as a witness to what it is like there in the dragon's belly. I'm not suggesting that worldwide progressivism, communism, Marxism, it's all falling the same stuff. It's all tyranny. Fascism, it's all tyranny. Those are merely play toys in the hands of the dragon. The dragon's ultimate statement will come in Revelation chapter 17. This is why this is so important. Will come. Let's begin with verse 8. Well, oh, verse 7. But the angel said to me, for this is 12, said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and the ten horns. Remember, brothers and sisters, this is big for me. The woman did not receive the deadly wound. It was the beast head that received the deadly wound. The woman continued on. And she continues on. The only thing that's keeping that deadly wound from being healed is the principles of the founding of this country. Religious and civil liberty. When those, in fact, Pope Pius IX, I believe it was, in 1854, said, I hate those principles. They are a pestle. When those go, who's coming back up? It's simple. 
It's simple. Apostate Protestantism will reach, have reached her hands across the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And a rejuvenated papacy will reign for a short time. But there will be no casualties among the righteous after the close of probation and no survivors among them. Let's go on. And I'll, and I'll, I'll put some landing wheels on this. I promise you. Seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's a direct reference back to Revelation 11. I wish I had more time. Revelation 11, which is clearly the French Revolution. If you want to know what the French Revolution looked like, just read, read a little bit about Portland. Start, you get a little flavor, and that's just like a little hors d'oeuvre. Just a little flavor. What verse are you on? I'm in 17, verse 8. <clears throat> we'll ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. We're not. We're not going to marvel. The people who know what's going on are not really marveling with what they see because they've read the great controversy. They're reading the Word of God. And may I say, they're going to read the Creed of Christ. <laughs> when they see the beast that was and is not, and yet is, here is the mind which has wisdom. I'm just going to read through it. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, so that must be number six. We're living in the last days, so one is. And the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. That, we believe, is the image to the beast. It's number seven. That's when America will start acting like the beast. And then she will reach her hand across and you've got another egg. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to close with this point. This is crucial. As long as America upholds those two lamb-like horns, let's talk about Revelation chapter 13, the second beast. As long as those lamb-like horns are not cut off, religious and civil liberty, The wound will never heal. But they're going to be cut off. Ellen White says those two horns are the secret of America's prosperity. Amen. Don't worry about climate change. Oh, yeah, be good consumers. Don't worry about running out of this or running out of that. The earth will yield its bounty until these go away. When these go away. When these go away, that's when all hell is breaking loose. We're seeing little tastes of it in the major cities right now. There's no religious and civil liberty there. There's none in those riots. You believe like they want you to believe, not like your liberty of conscience exercise leads you to believe. That's what it's going to look like everywhere. When the two horns, the landmark horns, are removed. My prayer is that you will read on through 17 and then go to chapter 18, verse 1. Because John also saw this earth lightly with the glory of the gospel. Isn't that good? Yes. So where sin abounds, I talk a lot about sin abounding today. I know that. Grace does much more. Yes. And those of us who believe that, we will be deeper students of the Word tomorrow, today, than we were last week. Mm -hmm. Please, please, start studying like you've never studied before. If you haven't read the Great Controversy in the last two or three years, read it again. If you've never read it, get after it. I recommend it to the sister here. 
that if you could only start with two chapters to kind of whet your appetite for these times, read these two. The Bible and the French Revolution. And the other one is Liberty of Conscience Threat. Those two chapters. There's only 40, 45 pages. You don't have to read all 650 pages to get the point. But those, although I strongly urge you to read all of them, those two chapters, I'm going to repeat that again. The Bible and the French Revolution and Liberty of Conscience Threat. Those are more relevant than the Mars newspaper. Father in heaven, wake us up. Wake me up. Wake Stacy and me up. Well, you know where we're going. And you know why we're going there. Not just because we'll be the only Seventh day Adventist in the whole county, but because we're going there to be a faithful center. To lift up the trumpet of the three angels' message so that that fourth angel Enlighten the earth with your glory. That's our need. That's our prayer. That's our desire. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.